Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing really well. So today I am back to do a video that I've not done before, but one that you probably could have seen coming from my channel, which is to talk about the theatre that I have seen recently. As we know, I'm a big fan of musical theatre especially. I'm in Musical Theatre Society. I wrote my dissertation about Hamilton, A Six and Come From Away. It's, it's a thing that I love very, very much. Basically my entire music taste is musical theatre and Disney, so it was gonna happen at some point and especially now that I live that much closer to London I've been taking every opportunity that I can to go see theatre to go down to the West End for a day or for a weekend or in the case of uh, August September I was there for a whole week just filled my boots up with as much theatre as I could this video is very much inspired by Karis over at Karis's Corner who has recently been doing monthly updates about the theatre that she has gone to see she lives in London so she has even more opportunity than I do to go binge as much theatre as she can and go see six for what what, what is it, like the 50th time, Karis? No shade at all, because I would absolutely do the same thing if I had the means to do so. <laughs> but yeah, I thought it would be really fun to talk about theatre that I've gone to see recently, and I hope you enjoy it. Now, there are quite a few shows that I'm going to be talking about that I have seen before, and quite likely will be going to see again. And because there's quite a few shows to get through, I'm probably gonna speed through the ones that I've seen before. I might speak more in depth about them another time. Let's be honest, some of the shows that I'm going to mention are ones that I will continue to see again and again, as long as I have the ability. For example, back at the end of August, I went to see Six on their UK tour. So that was me seeing Six for, I think my third, maybe my fourth time. Like I say, I wrote my dissertation on Six. I absolutely love this show, but I don't know how much I'm going to be able to say about it that I wouldn't have said elsewhere better. This is a show that is taking Henry VIII's Six Wives, but transplanting them into a pop concert setting with the wives competing to see which of the six of them had the hardest lot. It's such a fun, upbeat show. The energy of this musical is just so high. It is nonstop from start to finish. I will say as somebody who is a big fan of Tudor history there are a couple of lines that I have quibbles with that do occasionally like take me out of it and I'm like oh that's not right but for what six is I do kind of set them aside in my brain what I will do though is I will link down Dr Cat from Reading the Past her video on six because she goes into depth about some of the things that six got right about Tudor history and some things that it got maybe a little bit wrong because a lot of her thoughts are exactly the same as mine but ultimately it is a brilliant show I absolutely love it and I will go see it many many more times in the future Another show for me that I am a repeat offender of going to see is Come From Away. If you can only take one thing from this video, it is that you must go see Come From Away. Come From Away, once again, is one that I've spoken about before. It is the story of 9-11, but told not from New York City, but from the perspective of Gander in Newfoundland, who ended up taking thousands of stranded passengers from all of the flights that were meant to arrive in the USA, but could not once US airspace was closed. And it's just this really heartwarming, uplifting story about how these communities came together to support each other in this really dire, desperate time. It might be my favourite theatre production ever, I just think everything about it is spectacular. In terms of like my rankings of favourite musicals, there are definitely things like Les Mis or Hamilton that are definitely like my favourite, but in terms of like actually theatre experience, the theatre going experience, Come From Away is just mind-blowing. It is stunning. It's one of those really emotional shows that just are up and down. One minute I might be laughing, another I might be weeping. Every single cast member is playing multiple roles throughout the show and they are chopping and changing and each of them do a spectacular job. These are just such talented performers. I don't see how anybody could go to this show and not enjoy it. If you can only go to one show from this bunch, go see Come From Away, please. Or watch it on Apple TV. They do have a pro shot of Come From Away that is recently being put up. Go watch. Go watch. And then the last of the repeat offender shows that I'm going to talk to you about is Hamilton, which I actually saw yesterday. Yesterday at the time of filming anyway. What can I say about Hamilton that I haven't already said? I, I do, I just, I, I love this show. And obviously now that Disney Plus is in our lives, we're able to see Hamilton much more regularly. But I still think that seeing it live is an experience that you definitely should try and get. Obviously that's not accessible to everybody. I'm so glad that Disney Plus have put it up for everybody to watch. But man, nothing can beat being in that room. Being in the room where it happens. <laughs> and just being able to hear this ensemble, to see everything that's going on. I think this would be my fourth time seeing Hamilton, I want to say. And actually at this production, something went wrong. We had a show stop. Basically, I think what happened was the actor who played Aaron Burr, he injured himself I think he must have like gone over on his ankle during wait for it so he had to be taken off and what ended up happening was they stopped the show for 20 minutes the actor who does the dual role of Mulligan and Madison ended up swapping on to playing Burr then the actor who was playing Lawrence slash Philip ended up playing Madison and then I think somebody from the ensemble or like a cover ended up playing Lawrence so there was a massive like cast reshuffle and I just think it speaks to how fantastic the ensemble and the covers and swings are in a show 
and just how vital and important these roles are and they do not get as much credit as they deserve and at the end of the show everybody was on their feet because it was just spectacular to see how this cast were able to pull it together i mean obviously they would they are professionals but being able to see it right in front of your eyes is just ah. so yeah hamilton thumbs up <laughs> and now on to the shows that were new to me first off i'm going to talk about pretty woman the musical there are quite a few shows that i'm going to talk about that are adapted from an original film and pretty woman is the first of those so this was one that me and my mum went to see both of us are massive massive fans of the original film of pretty woman there are three films that are on constant rotation at my mum's house pretty woman notting hill and bridget jones so as soon as we found out that pretty woman was coming to london we had to pounce on that though i will admit i had a bit of trepidation about going to see this one and what the quality was going to be like because from everything that I had heard about it previously it just sounded like it wasn't that good like it was just a bit of a quick cash grab but I actually came from this really surprised I thought it was a really good adaptation of the film without being a complete carbon copy of course there's a lot of the script that is just kind of copy and pasted over but I actually do think they were able to make the stage show its own thing something that I really loved was that there was a real focus on dance in this which is something that was not there at all in the original film and I think was just a testament to how they were able to translate transfer from the medium of film to the medium of the stage. I would say the standout performer in this is Bob Harms who plays the happy man. You'll probably recognise the happy man from Pretty Woman because he's the guy at the beginning of the film who's like, welcome to Hollywood, everyone who comes to Hollywood got a dream, what's your dream? That is a role that is really expanded in the stage show but he also has another role within this and I'm not going to spoil it for you if you've not seen the show but when I realised what other character he was playing my jaw just dropped <laughs> and it was such a fantastic surprise and he does really well in both roles. It was just a really fun twist and I'm still not over it. I think the standout scene in this was the opera scene, the way that they were able to blend their original song with La Traviata, the combination of the set and the costumes and the dance. It was just stunning to watch and I would say that scene is worth the price of admission. Some of the changes between film and stage that they also make, uh, number one, one that is maybe the most egregious but I don't, I, I don't hate it but I think some people might, is that Vivian's iconic brown spotty dress is now blue. I don't know why, it just is. It's a pretty dress but I think so many people will be like, no! <laughs> There's much more focus in the show on Kit who is Vivian's best friend. Part of that happens because a lot of the scenes that are telephone scenes within the film are actually in person in the show. And I think that makes a lot of sense. There's also a moment that you will know from the film where Edward has to save Vivian. I'm not going to go into spoiler details for that if you don't want to hear it, but in the show they end up having Vivian save herself. I will say this was not a perfect show for me and there are a couple of things that I didn't love. For starters, I did not like any of Edward's songs. Every time he started singing I was just like, oh. I also feel like the sex scenes in this didn't work very well. Obviously because of what the film is about they were always going to be transferred over to the stage and I just felt they were a bit awkward on stage and I think those scenes are kind of a testament to what film can do that stage can't and that is really developing this sense of intimacy through the camera. You know in a film you're able to have close-ups, you're able to see people's faces whereas watching two actors simulate a sex scene on stage just kind of feels a bit creepy and voyeuristic and I was just kind of sat there like okay we're doing this. Would I see this again? Probably, but I would probably just go see it with my mum again rather than going on my own. It's not one that I'm rushing back to see, but I was definitely impressed with what I saw. Next up, we have Mamma Mia. This was the first of the shows that I saw when I was on my week off work back in September. And can you believe I've never seen Mamma Mia before? I've seen the film, of course, but I've never seen the stage show, which is even more egregious because my family actually have a bit of a connection in that one of my dad's cousins was actually the original Donna. So it's one that I've always wanted to see. I was especially thinking of Lena Norm's video on Mamma Mia, where she talks about how she went to see it when she was feeling really down and it was basically like chicken soup for the soul and that's what I wanted I was like yeah I'm taking time off work I want to feel restored recharged and I thought Mamma Mia was going to do that for me and unfortunately I was really let down by this. This was honestly like one of my least favourite shows that I've ever seen. I don't know if it was just me that day, I don't know if there's something wrong with me, probably, but this didn't do anything for me. Everything just felt very amateurish and I think it's another example of why film can sometimes be a little bit better than stage because the thing about the Mamma Mia film is that you're getting to see the beautiful scenery of Greece. You're getting to have the fun songs, you're getting to have the fun romp that this story is. You get the advantage of there being more space and more beautiful locations and sets, whereas watching the stage I was just reminded of how restrictive the stage can be when you literally just have a few meters to convey your story. I don't want to be really harsh but I wasn't really that fussed on any of the performers. I didn't think anybody brought anything stand out that I wouldn't have gotten from the film and everybody got up to dance at the end and I, I, I sat there. I just stayed, sat in my seat, because I wasn't feeling it. It was one of those moments that I'm very familiar with where you're looking around and everybody's having a good time, everyone's up dancing and I am just like no. 
I can't, I can't do it. I can't force myself to care more about this than I actually do. I think if I'm gonna go back to Mamma Mia, and I'm sure I will, definitely, it's gonna be through the film because I do love ABBA, I do love the idea of this, but the, the actual stage show, not for me. Next up, I'm gonna talk about Anything Goes. And I'm just realizing how much bigger this program is than all of the others that I have. And I'm gonna rave about this purely because I got the chance to see Sutton Foster perform, Broadway legend Sutton Foster. <laughs> Anything Goes is a classic musical. It's originally from, I think, 1934, written by Cole Porter, set on a ship that is traveling from New York to London. And we are following many hijinks on board. Passengers falling in and out of love, passengers who maybe should not be on board, but have stowed away anyway. We got some love, we got some crime. And what we also have are some really fun songs and absolutely world-class dancing. What you go to Anything Goes for is the dancing. I feel like I don't always appreciate dance as much as I should just because I'm not a dancer. It's not something that I am very good at and so I often don't go to shows explicitly to see the dancing but this just blew me away and it's a show like this that really makes you appreciate just what athletes these performers are. You basically have to be like Olympic level fit to do a show like this and my hat has to go off to all of these performers. I will say it's a show that feels like there's a lot of fun songs that are just kind of loosely strung together by a plot. The plot is probably the weakest thing but I found myself not really caring too much because the performance was so good. I think they are actually filming a performance of this and transmitting it live in cinema in a couple of weeks and if you have the opportunity to go see that then definitely do. I think by the time that this goes up the show should still be running and it's one that I definitely recommend seeing. Next up we have Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cinderella. This is one of the ones that I have the most conflicting feelings about. So this obviously tells the classic story of Cinderella but with a little bit of a twist. The twist being that in Andrew Lloyd Webber's own words this Cinderella is different. She is Cinderella with Doc Martens and black lace. And if you feel right now from my tone of voice that I am like inwardly rolling my eyes, y you'd be right. And I think that premise is probably my biggest issue with Cinderella, is that it just feels like a very dated take on Cinderella. That's what I felt through the entire performance was that this was probably a Cinderella that would have made more sense coming out like 10 years ago when this whole like, I'm not like other girls thing was much more prevalent. You know, that whole like, she wears short skirts, I wear t-shirts mentality. You know, I'm not saying that that's completely gone now, but I feel like we are much more critical of that kind of view, of that mentality of kind of tearing down other girls and criticizing other girls for being so shallow and liking pink and makeup and dressing up and my goodness, daring to have plastic surgery, how dare they? <laughs> I want to say straight away that any of the issues that I have with this show are not at all to do with the performers. The cast in this are brilliant, they were giving it their all, I just wish that they had had better material to work with. I especially want to give a shout out to Michael Hamway who was playing Sebastian, he I think is the cover for Sebastian, and he was on the day that I went to see it instead of Ivano, and I thought he was brilliant. His chemistry and his repartee with Carrie as Cinderella is so strong, I did I, I could barely believe that he wasn't always playing that role. I would say that my two favourite songs from this were two of the ballads, Sebastian's song Only You, Lonely You, and also Cinderella's song Far Too Late, which yes is definitely one that I am trying to put into my own repertoire. Thank you very much. Also, side note, I feel like Far Too Late is a song that I can totally see Josh Groban like transposing to his key and then doing a cover off. Like, can you hear it? Can you see it? And also, please can you do that? Thanks Josh. But like I say, I feel like the script and the songs were the biggest issue that I had with them. Don't get me wrong, the songs are catchy as hell, especially Bad Cinderella. I feel like I've had Bad Cinderella on a loop in my brain for the past few weeks, but that's more to do with the music than it is with the lyrics. And because I've had Bad Cinderella in my head so often, I can really see why on a lyrics level, it's really, really weak. I felt like the script and the songs just needed a bit of tightening. I feel like they needed another edit because a lot of the time they were just very clunky and awkward. I felt myself mentally like editing the songs in my head whilst I was watching it and just thinking like you could have literally put another word in there and that would have made much more sense it would have sound much less clunky but then there's also a very cynical part of me that thinks because of who the powers that be are of this show they were never going to get those edits no one was ever going to go up and be like hey andrew maybe that needs a rewrite. I think another thing that you can really tell is that there is a strong influence of Ever After in this script and they actually mention Ever After in the program. Ah there we go right there. I think there was this strong focus on trying to make Cinderella like strong independent woman. There's even a point where they try to get her to have a bit of camaraderie with one of her stepsisters, the one who's not treated as well by the stepmother, but ultimately I felt like the execution was not as good. There's also an element of this show that I don't love which is that every woman in this show hates each other and I feel like if you are trying to write a feminist retake of Cinderella for 2021, like why are all the women hating each other? Why is nobody here helping each other because they genuinely want the other to succeed and not because they're trying to get something out of them or they're just trying to get back at somebody else? 
at the same time as saying all this, I did have a good time. Like I say, I think the cast were absolutely exceptional. The costumes and the staging in this are beautiful. And I will say I was so fixated on the dances during the ball scene that I completely missed the fact that the stage was rotating. One of the added elements of this show is that during the ball scene there is a big change to the stage. And like I say, I was so mesmerized by the dancers and how well they were doing that I didn't notice this massive thing happening in front of me. So even though I have all those criticisms, I probably would go see Cinderella again. I probably would pay that little bit extra to go and be in one of those seats that change with the stage. But I can't pretend that I don't have issues with it especially with the script. And I think it's a shame considering how much talent is in this show. Please don't hate me for saying it. Another one that I'm probably not gonna talk about too, too much because I have mentioned it before is the Mirror and the Light done by the RSC. This is of course adapted from Hilary Mantel's third book in her Thomas Cromwell trilogy. And I've mentioned before that I was super excited by this because I actually got to meet Hilary Mantel. She was at one of the performances. It was fantastic. As you see, she signed my program. <laughs> Look at the joy on my face. <laughs> I already kind of ran through my thoughts about this in my October wrap up part one. I do think it was a brilliant show and I think the standout performer in it was Ben Miles as Thomas Cromwell. Seeing him perform live is definitely like the big selling point for me. That's not to say the other actors weren't fantastic, they were. I just think he deserves a special mention. The costumes in this were absolutely sublime. I always worry as somebody who is a big fan of Tudor fashion that they're not going to get it right, but no. No worries here. I think the way that they adapted the book to the stage, they had to do a lot of cuts to it, but I think a lot of them were necessary for the purposes of the show. If you are a fan of Tudor history and of this series, then I definitely would recommend you see it. However, I don't think that this is one to go to if you have no knowledge of Tudor history. The show has no interest in kind of simplifying things down, of explaining itself at all. I would say that you can go into it not having read the book, but if you don't have knowledge about Tudor history, especially this time period, then you are going to struggle. What you need to know going into this is you need to know about Jane Seymour and Anne of Cleves's terms as queen. You need to know about the dissolution of the monasteries and the pilgrimage of grace. And you kind of need to know about Thomas Cromwell's background. Otherwise, I would just worry that a lot of things would go over people's heads. But it is fantastic. If you get an opportunity to go see it, it's in its last few weeks, I think. So go see it. The penultimate show that I'm going to talk about today is Frozen. And I can probably give my review of this in full words. Adult only showing, please. I went to see this on Saturday and I did have a good time in terms of the show, but in terms of the audience, Oh my god. <laughs> As you can imagine for a Saturday matinee, very heavy with little children wearing Elsa costumes and they are very cute and I'm glad that they were having a good time but I did feel like bashing my head against a wall because I was just like oh my god. A lot of shouting, a lot of singing along, a lot of people moving around in their seats like this or kicking the chair. And I felt both me and my mum slightly starting to lose our rag. Actually, you know what? The kids were fine. It was the adults that were annoying me. It was the parents. The family next to me and the family in front of me ended up being told off by the staff because the family in front of me were trying to take photos and then the family next to me were trying to film Let It Go. Can I just say, public service announcement, if you are going to a West End theatre, you do not film. They tell you at the beginning of the show not to film, so why would you film? But that's just me kind of ranting about what it was like to be in the audience. Like, the actual show itself was really good fun. I thought it was really interesting how they adapted it from the film to the stage, how they were able to do the magic. You've got all of these performers who are just giving it their all, who absolutely love what they're doing. And kind of like with Pretty Woman, they put more of a focus on dance, which is really lovely as an adaptation from film to stage. And I think especially being able to watch Let It Go live and seeing the costume change that they do for Elsa. Once again, another moment that is worth the Price of admission. One thing I will say though was that I wasn't really a big fan of the additional songs that they put in. I feel like the only one that really bears the weight of the show is What Do You Know About Love, which is a duet between Elsa and Kristoff. That's one that they perform when they're on the way to try and find Elsa and then it has a couple of reprises. The other additional songs I felt were just kind of there to take up time. I didn't really feel like they added anything. I feel really bad because I think one of my least favourite songs is one that Hans performs and already I feel really bad for the actor playing him, Oliver Olmsen, because like every time he comes on stage people were booing him and every time that he started singing a solo I could feel like all of the children around me kind of like turned their brains off and they were like we'd have to pay attention to this because I already know that he's the villain oh but what doesn't really help is that his songs are just very bland anyway and it's not telling us any information that we didn't already know it's just him kind of ranting through song about how he's the 13th in line and I just think he's got a lovely voice he's a good performer like give him a nice song if you're going to try and expand the show like give Hans a little bit more to do I was also kind of sad to see and I, I kind of expected it because a lot of the time with these film musical to stage musical adaptations they do end up adding songs but also cutting songs from the film and I knew that out of all of the songs in the film that they were going to cut probably the first one to go would be the very first song which is Frozen Heart. It doesn't have much of a bearing to the plot it just kind of sets up the world but I genuinely think that Frozen Heart is the best song in all of Frozen. I just really enjoy these workmen singing and unfortunately it was cut in the show. 
and I just think that's such a shame. Would I go see Frozen again? Honestly, probably not, because I feel like I probably would lose it with the audience again. <laughs> And little children don't need to see Angry Charlotte. Like, no, they're, 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 they're fine. But it was good fun. Frozen isn't one of my favourite Disney films, but it is really cool to see live. And then the final show that I'm going to talk about today is The Prince of Egypt musical. Once again, adapted from the original film from 97, 98, which is one of my favourite animated films of all time. Definitely like my favourite non-Disney animated film. I'd had high hopes for this when I originally booked it, but I'd heard kind of meh things about it. And I feel like I came out of it feeling like on the more positive side, but still a little bit meh. Another show where the performers are absolutely giving it their all. The people on stage are supremely talented. The staging was absolutely beautiful and one of the things I did question was how they were going to do things like the plagues, how they were going to do the parting of the Red Sea, and I feel like they were able to adapt that really well. Obviously not as well as they're able to do in animation, and there were moments where I was just like, yeah, obviously the film did it better. But really fun to see like the creativity that was involved in making this show. Being able to hear this music sung live was just absolutely chilling. The songs in Prince of Egypt are some of my favourite songs of all time, especially Through Heaven's Eyes and When You Believe. Though when we are talking about songs, I cannot talk about this musical and how it was adapted from the film without talking about my favourite song in the film, which is The Plagues. And I'm really, really sad to say that they didn't completely cut The Plagues out, because obviously you can't do a Moses story and cut the plagues out. But instead of performing the song as it was in the film, they kind of splice it with a reprise of a new song for the show. There's a song that I think is called No Power on Earth, and instead of having the singing between Moses and Ramesses where they sing, once I called you brother, once I got the chance to make you laugh, was all I ever wanted. Instead of that, they splice in No Power on Earth. And I'm sorry, but it's just not as good a song. <laughs> they do have the ensembles part of the plague, where they're singing, I send the pestilence and plague into your house, into your bed, into your streams, into your streets, into to your bed, which I did love being able to see live, but I just wish they could have done The Plagues as it was in the film and not added this other song. Because The Plagues is my favourite song, it's one of my favourite songs of all time. And it was just gone, gone. <laughs> Once again, like with Frozen, I felt like a lot of the additional songs that were put into the stage show that weren't in the film didn't really add much. It was just kind of padding out the runtime. I feel like there's much more of a focus in this on playing up the humour. The Prince of Egypt, the film, is not like, it's not a hysterical film, but there is humour to it. There are quietly funny moments in in that film, which you do kind of need to lift the film and make it something that children can watch rather than it being a deeply depressing movie. But I feel like they pushed a little bit too much in the stage show for some of these jokes to make it funny funny, and it just felt a little bit forced in my opinion. They also really play up Moses's guilt. There is a song in this where Moses is singing to God and asking why him, which felt like it was taken directly out of the Gethsemane scene from Jesus Christ Superstar. Kind of like Stephen Schwartz watched Jesus Christ Superstar and was like, I think I'll have me a bit of that. I understand why it was there, it just felt a little bit derivative to me. Hello, hello, this is editing Charlotte here from the future, because I wanted to pop in and talk about a change that they made between the film and the show that actually did really irk me. It was probably my biggest problem with the show, and that is basically the motivation and the resolution of the two brothers. And that is basically that the end of Prince of Egypt has a much more positive, uplifting ending for the two brothers and their relationship. One of the changes that they make between the film and the show is that Ramesses in the show, actually, he wants to free the Hebrews. He originally comes to an agreement with Moses that he will free them, but as a result of pressure from his wife and from the high priest, he reneges on that promise. And the end of the show, basically what ends up happening, once Moses parts the Red Sea, once the Hebrews have gotten to the promised land, Moses and Ramesses reconcile, and it's made very clear that Ramesses is happy for Moses to go free, but the high priest isn't. And so when God intervenes and the water basically recedes and goes back to its original spot, it ends up drowning the high priest, but leaving Ramesses intact, and he's happy despite the fact that he and Moses are now separate again. He's actually happy with the fact that they're all free. And I don't know, it kind of rubbed me up the wrong way because it kind of had this message of like, Ramesses did nothing wrong, it was just this one high priest that was the issue, but if you get rid of the one high priest then everything is fine, slavery has been fixed. And that just felt really disingenuous to me, and I kind of felt like the film was more powerful. It is Ramesses' insecurity about not living up to his father, about carrying on his work, about being the weak link in the chain, but also his own cruelty. That means that he keeps slavery in place in Egypt. And it isn't a case of getting rid of one bad egg. It is his own issue, his own cruelty. And the two brothers are not reconciled by the end of the film. And I think that's a really powerful message, a really poignant message of sometimes you do have these massive irreconcilable differences, hopefully not as bad as one of you like slavery and the other one very much doesn't. But sometimes with family, 
there are differences like that that you can't reconcile and leaving is the best option. I hope I didn't just simplify that story at all by comparing it in that kind of way, but I feel like that's a much more powerful message. And I feel like the show kind of lets Ramesses get away scot-free with slavery. I, 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 I don't know, I didn't like that. But did I enjoy it? Yeah. I think because I loved the film so much, I was always going to be a bit critical of the stage adaptation because I think the film is perfect. Would I see it again? Probably, but I maybe wouldn't see it before things like Six or Come From Away or Hamilton. But if somebody turned to me and said, hey Charlotte, I've got a spare ticket for Prince of Egypt, do you wanna come? I'd say yes. I had a good time. I think if you're a fan of the film, you'll just find things to really enjoy in this, but you'll also find things that you're like, why did they do that? So there we go. Those are all of the shows that I have seen recently and my thoughts about them. That was a lot. <laughs> do let me know about any theatre that you've been to see recently or something that you're desperate to go watch. I'd love to hear from you. I hope you're having a fantastic, fantastic day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks. Bye.